ever get that feeling? Yeah. Scrolling through the news, you know, and you hit a headline that just throws you for a loop. Like what? Oh, something like Bank of Canada raises interest rates again. And you're left sitting there thinking, okay, but what does that even mean for me? Like, what's the actual impact? Yeah, it can feel pretty overwhelming, all those financial terms and government jargon. Sometimes it feels like you need a whole other dictionary. Exactly. And that's why we're doing this deep dive today. We're tackling Canada's federal political system. Trying to break it down so it actually makes sense. All right. And we're going deep into a textbook excerpt to do it. Because everyone loves reading textbooks, right? Well, maybe not reading them. Yeah. But we're going to try to make it a little less dry, a little more like... I don't know, a conversation maybe. Definitely more engaging than just reciting facts. Exactly. And one of the most important things to understand about our system is how power is divided. Right. We often hear about the three branches of government, but what does that actually mean? So we've got the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Three branches. Like, to help me picture it, I imagine them as a team, you know. I like that. A team working together, each with their own specific role. That's it. So who are the key players on this Team Canada? Okay, so first up, we have the executive branch. They're like the doers, if you will. The ones who get things done. Exactly. This is where you'll find the prime minister and the cabinet. They're responsible for putting laws into action, running the country on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure things actually happen. So they're the ones making the decisions that really impact our daily lives. You could say that. And then there's the legislative branch. These are the lawmakers. This is where we find the House of Commons and the Senate. The ones who debate and create the laws. Exactly. They're the ones who grapple with the big issues, hash out the details. And ultimately, if everyone agrees, those ideas become laws. Right. OK, so we've got the doers, the lawmakers. Who else is there? Ah, yes. Can't forget the third member of our government team, the judicial branch. And they're the referees. Referees. That's right. Think about it. We've got the lawmakers making the rules of the game, and then you need someone to interpret those rules, make sure they are applied fairly. That's where the courts come in. They make sure everyone's playing by the rules. Yeah. I like it. Exactly. And speaking of rules, our source actually brings up an interesting example of how this all works in action. It talks about how back in 1971, Prime Minister Trudeau created a new cabinet position. The environment portfolio. The environment portfolio. So like someone specifically in charge of environmental issues. Exactly. It might seem like a no-brainer now, but at the time, it was a pretty big deal. And get this. That decision back then has had a ripple effect all the way to today. Really? How so? Well, think about it. That decision to create that position ultimately led to the creation of policies and departments focused on environmental protection. Which is more important than ever. For sure. We're seeing the impact of that decision in things like carbon pricing and investments in renewable energy. It's like that one decision set a whole chain of events in motion. Exactly. And that's a perfect example of how the executive branch, those doers we were talking about, can have a lasting impact on the direction of the country. So we've got these branches of government all working together. But who are the people within those branches actually calling the shots? Well, in the executive branch, a lot of it comes down to the prime minister's cabinet. It's their team, you know, the people they choose to head up different areas of the government. And our source actually had this fascinating image, Stephen Harper's cabinet from way back in 2007. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. It's like a class photo, but for like the most important class in the country. That's a great way to put it. And each of those faces represents a different portfolio, right? Like their area of responsibility. Exactly. You've got everything from Canadian heritage to intergovernmental affairs. Honestly, some of those titles are a mouthful. I'm not even sure I could tell you what some of them actually do. Well, Canadian heritage in 2007, for example, that minister would have been responsible for things like national parks, cultural institutions. Even the CBC fell under their umbrella. Wow, that's a pretty broad range of stuff. It is. And it's interesting to see how those portfolios change over time, too. Like, new ones pop up depending on what's important to the government at the time. It's a reflection of their priorities. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not like the prime minister just throws darts at a board with random job titles on it when they're picking their cabinet, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be some strategy involved. Oh, absolutely. It's a very calculated process. Mm. They consider experience, regional representation. You want to make sure voices from all across Canada are heard, right? And then, of course, there's political affiliation. 
because yeah. the prime minister needs a team that's on board with their vision for the country. Right. They've got to be able to work together, agree on the big picture, mm -hmm. which is where political parties come in. Right. Those different groups with their own sets of ideas about how the country should be run. Exactly. Think of political parties like, I don't know, different clubs at school. They have their own beliefs, their own goals, yeah. and they work together to try and make those goals a reality. OK, I like that analogy. Yeah. So instead of campaigning for like longer recess or better cafeteria food, they're campaigning for changes in government policy. Exactly. And just like those clubs, political parties offer voters a choice. Do you agree with their vision? Do their priorities align with yours? It's all connected. OK, that's actually a really interesting way to think about it. So let's say you were putting together your dream team, your ideal cabinet. What would be your top priorities? What issues would you tackle first? Oh, that's a tough one. But it's the kind of question we should all be asking ourselves. What matters most to us? Because at the end of the day, that's what this whole system is supposed to be about, right? Serving the people. It's easy to forget that last part sometimes, that it's about U.S. Right. Like our individual voices actually matter. Exactly. But how much power do we really have? It's not like we can just stroll into Parliament and start making demands. Well, maybe not stroll in. But the book actually calls citizens the lifeblood of the system. OK, I like that analogy, the lifeblood, huh? So how do we become more than just like a red blood cell floating around? How do we actually make a difference? It starts with the basics, right? Voting in elections. That's our chance to choose the people who we believe will best represent us. Right. Making sure our voices are heard through our votes. Exactly. But it's more than just that one day at the ballot box. We can contact our MPs directly, you know, mm. share our concerns, our ideas. Be more proactive. For sure. And there are town halls, community meetings, even engaging in, you know, respectful debate online. These are all ways we can participate, make our voices heard. So it's really about staying engaged even after the election signs come down. Absolutely. And you know what else I thought was interesting? The book actually encourages us to imagine ourselves as the prime minister for a day. It's a thought experiment. If you had the power to tackle one issue, what would it be? How would you address it? Wow. That's a really interesting question. It really makes you think about what your top priorities would be, what changes you'd want to see. Right. It kind of puts things into perspective. And speaking of perspective, the source also included these incredible photos of past Canadian prime ministers going all the way back to, like, the late 1800s. Oh, yeah. All those serious faces in those old tiny suits. It's a good reminder that our system has been evolving for over 150 years, and it's still changing, you know? Constantly adapting. It makes you wonder what a photo of Canada's leaders 50 years from now will look like. What changes will they be grappling with? Now, that's a question I don't think any of us can answer. But it's definitely something to think about. For sure. It all comes back to staying engaged, staying informed, and using our voices to shape the future we want to see. Exactly. And realizing that we all have a role to play in shaping that future. Well said. It's been quite the journey exploring Canada's political system today. Hopefully everyone listening feels a little more informed, maybe even inspired, to get a bit more involved. I hope so too. Because at the end of the day, it's our country and we all have a stake in its future. Couldn't agree more. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.